And so this morning, go ahead and be turning your Bibles to, to the Gospel of John, uh, the 14th chapter, and that's where we're going to spend our time. It's been said that the, hosp- the, the, the church is like a hospital for sinners, amen? And I, and I know that, that people come in here week after week, banged up and bruised up from the week, and today would be a, a day of encouragement for you, I would hope. And God even works in my life, just like he does in your lives, in different ways, and uh, every once in a while, God will do some things that will make us kind of pause and check ourselves, right? To kind of, you know, a reality check, if you will, where uh, our theology and real life kind of collide, that, that kind of come together, where he really, you know, what you believe and what, and what your reality is, those thing, two things kind of mingle together, and that's what's uh, happened for me this week. And uh, I tend to, you know, give out a lot of advice to people with, and how to how to deal with struggles in life. Quite often, that's what pastors do. You know, a lot of our time is spent just trying to minister to people and to uh, to give biblical wisdom to the the things of life that they run into. I, I pray with people all the time to, to uh, that God would encourage them, to strengthen them, to give them wisdom, to make it through certain situations, give them guidance. Uh, I study and I pray and I prepare sermons, right, to be able to explain God's word and to, to give. Uh, understanding to the congregation i do these things week after week uh, i tell people that that god is our strength and our hope and our refuge i tell people that god is where we get our comfort from and i tell people to trust in god's sovereignty that he has a plan i do this all the time right week after week well this week is one of those weeks where i had to kind of pause and check myself it's been one of those type of weeks for me uh, you know a, a week to practice what i preach a, a week to kind of uh, uh, listen to my own sermons, a, a week to kind of preach a sermon to myself. And many of you know that a, a dear friend of mine and mentor passed away unexpectedly early this week. And, and uh, as you know, details unfolded later in the week, and I found out he took his own life. And so uh, it makes it even worse. I mean, it's never a good thing when somebody passes, but when they take their own life to get to a point where they feel so hopeless and so so desperate that they can't find any other way out, it, it makes it even worse. And he's a pastor and a professor at the seminary, and so uh, it's really impacted me uh, this week. I've cried cried a lot this week. More than I cried uh, for family. My heart's been troubled. Dr. Gibson impacted my life quite a bit. But God in his tender care brought to mind this morning's passage. It's read nearly at every Christian funeral because of the comfort it brings. It's a reminder and an encouragement of the hope that we have in Christ. My, my friend's faith has now been made sight and he is with his Lord and his King. And even better, because I've trusted Christ, I'll see him again someday because I've trusted Jesus as well. And so I take comfort in that. And I'm certain that there are many others here this morning that have come with troubled hearts for any number of reasons. Having health problems, financial struggles, relationship issues, loneliness. And maybe even someone here has lost someone and that wound just won't seem to heal. And you have a troubled heart. So I would ask that you would pray and the Lord would use this text to minister to your troubled heart this morning as he has done for mine. Let me pray before we begin. God, thank you so much uh, for this day. Thank you for this passage. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the Holy Spirit and the comfort that he brings. God, I pray that this morning, uh, above all days, Father, if I have not preached a a message since I've been here that would... Uh, point somebody to you, Father, that they would be comforted, Father, that, that some would uh, that would understand grace even better today. Father, I pray that you would do that. Father, help me to, to speak this uh, passage. Help me to explain this passage. Help me to, 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 to give this, uh, this scripture and do it justice, Father. Work through my words. Let them be your words. Father, thank you again for all that you do for us. Thank you most of all for your son, Jesus, the giver of life. We ask these things in his name. Amen. All right, so this this passage in the Gospel of John, just a little bit of background. Uh, 
things were, were winding up in, in Jesus' ministry is where we're at, that, that he had done lots of things, miracles, and, and, and been preaching and going around all over the place. And, and, it's, and, and, and he knew his time was up, and he knew how his disciples were going to, they were in for some tough days uh, uh, were, were coming for him. And so his whole goal was to, to give them some comfort uh, before, before he departed because his death was coming. The cross was coming his way. Everything was coming to an head the way God had designed it. And this wasn't the first time that he had told his disciples. If, you, if you're familiar with the Gospels, he would quite often speak of how his time was coming and that his, his time would come, that, that he would suffer and die. And, and even Peter at one point said, not going to happen, not if I have anything to say about it. And you remember what Jesus told him, he, he said, get behind me, Satan. He said, you don't know what you're talking about. This has to happen. It will happen. This, this is a necessity for you. The disciples had seen Jesus get himself in, in pickles before, right? That he would say things to the Pharisees and you know, they would come to arrest him and they would plot and scheme against him, but he'd always seem to find a way to get out, right? He would like disappear almost like a ninja, right? That, that all of a sudden he would slip through a crowd and they would come and they'd show up and they'd look for Jesus and he's gone. He gets away every time, but not this time. Not this time. Everything was going right on schedule that, that nothing ever happens too early or too late with, with Jesus. Uh, Jesus and the twelve, they were gathered in the upper room for what we know as the Last Supper, the, the, the last meal. He was there with them, and he had already shocked them once. And he, had, he had taken on the, the role of the servant in the home, right? He took, the, he took off the, his outer garments and got a towel and got a wash basin and began washing their feet, right? Serving them even to the end. And after he had done that and, and, and explained what he was doing, that he dropped a, another bombshell on them. <laughs> he said, one of you going to betray me. Right? One of you are going to betray me. And, it, and, it, and I always read that passage. It kind of shocks me the way they responded. They say, is it I? Is it I? They're looking around. They're saying they, they know their own hearts that they're capable of doing this thing. That I would never want to do this, but I am capable of doing this. And they're looking around the table. Is it, is it me? And then, and then Peter leans over because John sat next to Jesus, he said, hey, ask Jesus who it is. And so he leans over to Jesus and he tells John who, who it would be. He's talking about dipping the bread and handing the bread off. And it was Judas. It was Judas. He was speaking about Judas, Judas and how he would betray him. And, and we look at the text and we know that Judas, he sold out Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. That's it. 30 pieces of silver. And there's lots of discussion about what was going on with Judas and you know, you know, what was his motive and this and that. And, and I've heard different things. And maybe it's all speculation, but maybe he, maybe he thought Jesus was going to escape again, right? Maybe because he, he's seen him, he's always escaped. Maybe he was going to, you know, Judas would make some money and, Ju and Jesus would escape and everything would be fine, but not this time. Not this time. When they came and arrested him, he actually got arrested and, and, and had to, it, 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 gr it grieved Judas to finally see what happened. And it grieved him so much he went out and hung himself. He took his own life after seeing what had happened. And this is a, a great example, a perfect example of the collaboration between man's free will and God's sovereignty. We talked about that this last Sunday night, the, the sovereignty of God. Because God didn't cause Judas to betray Jesus. He didn't cause that. He didn't orchestrate that. That, that was Judas' free will choice. But God used Judas' free will choice to, of betraying Jesus to accomplish his purposes. Right, the, the, the two worked together. And of course, when Ju Judas uh, uh, left, he departed, it was like lighting a fuse on a stick of dynamite. Once that fuse was lit, this thing was going to blow. Right? The, 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 the ball had been started in motion. The, the chain of events has, had, had been set in motion. It was just now a matter of time before Jesus would be arrested. But even as Jesus was heading towards the cross, he, his mind was on his disciples. He was thinking about them and, and what they would go through. Jesus knew the hurt and the confusion that they would experience when they came, and even more so when they saw him crucified. What would happen to their Lord? So Jesus comforted his followers, troubled hearts with his words nearly 2,000 years ago, and I would ask this morning that we let these same words comfort us this morning. The same words bring some peace to us, to our troubled hearts as well. And the Apostle John's going to show us three ways that our troubled hearts can be comforted this morning. And the, and the first way our troubled hearts can be comforted is because we know Jesus is God. Right? Jesus is God. We know this. In verse 1 it says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. Right? 
believe also in me. Jesus was telling his disciples, believing in me is the same as living, believing in God. Because Jesus is God. You know that, right? That some, sometimes we, we make so much about Jesus being the son of God that we forget that Jesus is God as well. That he is fully God. He is fully man, but fully God all at the same time. It was, we remember in the text what got Jesus in trouble so much with the, the Pharisees and the religious leaders was his claims that he was God, the Son of God, and, or, 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 or that he was God himself. The, it was blasphemy to them, and that's what brought these charges against him. See, even the disciples, the early church, had a, we're not the only ones who struggled with the Trinity. Amen? Does anybody in here under, fully understand that and grasp how the Trinity works? And there's lots of analogies, and people try to say, well, it's like this, and it's like that. I haven't found any that do it justice and really most of the ones that i've seen are really bad really bad examples of the trinity so we just have to accept it we see it in the scripture we see it clearly the bible shows us that the three distinct persons yet only one god we see the father we see the son and we see the spirit all three but yet there's only one god and of course if we if you look at the text and examine the text there even there even seems to be among the the, the trinity there seems to be a subordination you know, or, or a pecking order if you will we see how uh, the Father is on the throne, and we see how the Son is fully submitted to Him, to him uh, uh, as, in His manifestation as, as, as Jesus. And we also see the Holy Spirit come along, and the Holy Spirit's all about pointing and glorifying Jesus and pointing everybody to Jesus. So how this thing all works is a mystery. We just know that it is. And for us this morning, I want us to be careful. I want us to be careful not to fall into that trap of, I don't want us to be the ones that, uh, that we lose sight of who Jesus is, and that, that he's just the Son of God, but Jesus is God. And that should bring us great comfort this morning. If we look at the, the text, just a, an example of, of, of reminding us of who Jesus is, when we read the Bible, a lot of times in the Old Testament, we, we, we get this mindset of God, and we say, well, the God of the Old Testament seems to be cranky. He seems to be mean, right? He, he seems to be harsh and not very loving, but, but in, the, in the New Testament, we see Jesus, and if Jesus is God, well, he seems to be a lot more loving. He seems nice. I like, I like Jesus, but I don't care too much for, for the God in the Old Testament. That, that, those two, let me tell you something this morning. Jesus is the God of the Old Testament, right? They're, they're, not, they're not separate beings. It's not, it's not like Jekyll and Hyde, right? Jesus is the God of the Old Testament, and he worked himself out in different ways, and so we need to be careful not to do that. Shockingly, even the disciples were still not quite sure about Jesus being God. Even after seeing what he did over and over again, they still wasn't quite resigned to the fact that he was God. They walked with him and saw his miracles and all the things he had done for nearly three years. They had flip-flopped between belief and unbelief, just like many of us, it seems like. We're so much like the disciples. Of course, Peter made that great confession about who Jesus was in Matthew 16, and he still didn't fully get it. Matthew 16, 13 to 16 says, When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I am, the Son of Man? Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Right? That came out of Peter's mouth. Y'all know how Peter responded to Jesus later? Right? We know that. So there's this, there's this thing, this, this uh, uh, confusion still that, that lasted with the disciples all the way up until Jesus was resurrected. It wasn't until he just showed up in their midst and said, Peace be with you, that they fully understand that he was God and when he was resurrected just like he said he did. Jesus is fully God and fully man. We have to get this. We have to, this is the foundation of our faith, the, the foundation of, of, of Christianity, that Jesus is fully God and fully man. Because and, and, there's problems that would arise. If he's not fully God and, and he's not fully man, there's some things that we have problems with. If he were not fully human, he could not atone for our sins. Right? Because it, it's, it's like you cannot exchange an apple for an orange. Apples for apples. A human has to atone for a human. And so he has to be fully human. But then there's, there's another problem. If, if he were not fully God, then he would not be sinless. Right? Because only the sinless could atone for the sinful. And so these things had to happen. And they were only culminated in Jesus. Of course, God the Son has always existed. 
what we don't understand is that this whole thing about God becoming a man, that's why we celebrate Christmas. That's why we celebrate Christmas. It's called the theological ter- term is, is the incarnation. And John uh, chapter 1, four, verse 14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You want to know something that's really going to kind of blow your mind? I don't know if you think about it this way. Jesus is still fully God and still fully man. Right now, right now at the right hand of the Father, a man is sitting next to the Father in heaven. Right? Fully man. Still flesh and blood just like you and I are, but glorified and perfect. So how can we be comforted this morning by this, by knowing this? How can we be comforted by Jesus being God? I would say it's because uh, Jesus being God is sovereign and has authority over all things. He is fully in control. Nothing happens apart from his knowledge or his allowance. Colossians uh, 1, 15 through 18 says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, and that in all things he may have the preeminence. So what does this mean? (laughs) It means that no matter what happens, Jesus is in complete control in complete control so that should bring us comfort everything will work out just as it should when all is said and done that's what paul said in, in romans eight twenty eight, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love god to those who are the called according to his purposes all right so knowing that jesus is god should be a great comfort to our troubled hearts this morning also our troubled hearts can be comforted because we know Christians will dwell with Jesus for all eternity. Right? That's, our, that's, our, that's our destiny. That's where we will spend our eternity. Verses 2 through 4 says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Now, we talked about this a little bit in Sunday school this morning. Uh, Ronnie, again, I think he's sneaking into my, my, my office and looking at my notes. And uh, he, we, he started bringing up this the point. We're talking about the mansion, this, this the word that's used there, mansion. Uh, people get excited uh, about the mansion that they'll receive that's waiting, on them, waiting for them uh, on the streets of gold, right? That people always talk about that stuff. Oh, my mansion. I'm going to get my mansion and all this stuff. Uh, the, the mansion is, is really a poor translation, of the Greek word. The Greek word there, it, it, it's, uh, it's mone. It, it literally means a staying or abiding, a dwelling or an abode. That's what it's talking about. Uh, th- that same word is, is used a little earlier in uh, this same chapter in verse 23. It's only used twice. Uh, here and in earlier in verse 23, uh, John fourteen twenty three says, Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we we will come to him and make our home with him. That's what it's talking about here. So don't don't this this idea of a mansion. Don't just get rid of that. That's that's bad. That's a bad translation. It's a poor word to be used there. It's it's focusing on the better way is a a dwelling place. Uh, Other translations do a better job than the King James and the New King James. The NIV says uh, uh, rooms. Uh, New American Standard says dwelling places, that, which, which is really what's communicating the, the proper thought here. And the disciples would understand this. The disciples would understand exactly what Jesus was talking about in, in the ancient days. In, in, the, in the Hebrew culture, the father, you know, right, being the patriarch of the family, when a new family member was added in or, or sons were brought in, the, they didn't build separate houses. They, built, they added on to the, 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 the main house. Right, just just an addition, just keep on adding on. And so they knew exactly what was going on here. The, the point is that, that Jesus was going to go prepare a place for them. And, and, the, and the most important thing is that they were going to be with Jesus. The most important thing about heaven is that Jesus is going to be there. Not, not that a mansion is waiting for you, but, but Jesus is waiting for you there. In Revelation uh, 21, 1 through 3, 
and says, Now I say, I saw a, a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy, city, the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Right? That's what we look forward to. That's what we look forward to. It's not, it's not what we're going to get. It's going to be who we get. It's not about a mansion. It's not even about a, a place per se. I would even go so far as say, if you're more excited about where you'll be spending eternity rather than who you will be spending eternity with, you don't grasp the significance of Jesus. You, you really miss the boat on that. You're really missing out on, on the whole point of Jesus. Of course, Jesus wasn't trying to sell the disciples on how great heaven was. That's not what he was doing. He wasn't trying to, to paint some picture about, man, it's going to be just so awesome, and, and you're, gonna, you're really going to look forward to this, and you ought to see this and all that. He's saying I'm, that, that you will be with me. That's the point. That's what he's trying to encourage them about. He's wanting to comfort them with the, with the assurance that he would be there with them. Of course, the reward of our faith is not heaven. The reward of our faith is an eternity with Jesus. You let that sink in. All those that have trusted Christ in, in this life will spend all of eternity with Jesus. And here's one more little, little thing that we need to put in the back of our minds and hold on to. Because life here is hard. We know that. We, we experience that. And, and, and God's word promised that. But for those who have trusted Christ in this life, no matter how bad it is, uh, it's as close to hell as we'll ever experience. Right? It's as close to hell as we'll ever experience. We'll be with the Lord for all eternity. That's why Paul had this. He knew this truth. He had it sewn into his heart and his mind, faced some tremendous difficulties. That's why that the Apostle Paul seemed like he seemed to look forward to death at times. If you if you read his writings, uh, because he knew Jesus was, uh, was waiting for him. In Philippians one twenty one, he says these words, these shocking words. He says, "For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain." Right? Paul was not suicidal. Right? He, he wasn't psychotic, he wasn't, he, but his view of Jesus and being with Jesus was so big and so precious to him. He says that this life is good, I, I love my friends, I love my family, but you know who I love more? Jesus. Jesus, I love Jesus more. I long to be with him more than anything else on this earth. And this truth is what takes some of this thing away from my grief this week. It still hurts, right? It still hurts, it still hurts you whenever you lose somebody. But knowing that Dr. Gibson is with Jesus brings me great comfort. And knowing that when any of my brothers and sisters in Christ, when they pass from this earth, they'll be with Jesus too. That brings me great comfort. Also, according to this passage, Jesus had a dwelling place waiting for my friend. He had a dwelling place waiting for my friend. And according to this passage, Jesus has a dwelling place waiting for you and for me if you've trusted in Christ. That great gospel song, I bowed on my knees and cried holy, captures the feeling that we will have when we arrive in heaven. If you're familiar with that song, one of the main parts of the song, it says this. It says, as I entered the gates of that city, my loved ones all knew me well. They took me down the streets of heaven, so that scenes were too many to tell. It says, I saw Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac talk with Mark and Timothy but I said, I want to see Jesus because he's the one who died for me. Right? That's what it's all about. That's, what, that's our focus. That, that we're going to, when we get there, we, we say all these things now, right? We say all these things, what we're going to do. Some of us have these, these attitudes like, well, when I see Jesus, I got a couple of questions for him. I'm going to ask him about why he did this and why he did that. No, you won't. No, you won't. Well, I, I'm, when I get to heaven, the first person, I'm, I want to find this person. I want to see Nana and I want to. You're going to be, you're going to, I want to ask Paul some things, man. Some of his letters were hard. Romans was difficult. I got some questions for Paul to try to explain to me. You're going to walk right by those guys. And you're going to say, I'm, where, where are those hands? Where's that guy with the holes in the hands? That's who I want to see. And that's our goal. That's what we're looking for. That's where we find comfort. Knowing Christians will dwell with Jesus for all eternity should be a great comfort to our troubled hearts. And then the last thing we see in our passage this morning, our our troubled hearts can be comforted because we know that salvation only comes through faith in Jesus. 
You know, it just only happens. We can only be comforted if we understand that there's only one way to, to, to be with the Lord. There's only one way to, to be saved, verses 5 and 6. And said the, Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and, and how uh, can we know the way? And, and this, this verse, man, you need to write it down and, and highlight it, start, whatever. This is one of the most important verses in the whole Bible. It said, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Y'all get that? Not one of the ways, not you know, not not you know, not an option. The the way. There's no other way but but through trust in Christ. And for us, we like options, right? Most of the time, options are a good thing. For most things in life, having lots of options is usually seen as a good thing. But therein lies the dilemma for us as as Christians, right? As Christianity. Uh, we're, we're viewed as being intolerant of many things. Uh, Christianity does not allow for options when it comes to who God is and, and, and how we can have a relationship with, a relationship with Him. We, we can't pick and choose those things. That God has laid it out specifically in His Word. We don't get to decide. We don't get to come the way we want to come. We, 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 he has given us a way to approach Him, and that's the only way. And it's through faith in Jesus Christ. Contrary to what many well-intended people say, all paths do not lead to heaven. They do not lead to heaven. Not all paths do not lead to heaven. That's just not true. That's a, that's a fairy tale that has a very bad ending, I might add. The Bible makes it perfectly clear in verse 6 that there are not multiple ways to be saved. Right? Not multiple paths to the Father. And John dealt with this quite a bit, that, that false teachings were, were, were rampant in the early church. John would say that any teaching that denies that Jesus is God and that, that only faith in him and his finished work on the cross is sufficient for the forgiveness of sin, he'd call it a false teaching. A false teaching. And he would even go so far as to say that it comes out of the, the spirit of Antichrist. Right? Antichrist. And so we, we, most of the time we think about the Antichrist as just one person. Right? The beast and the, the 666 and all these things. But it goes much further than that. A, a spirit of Antichrist is anyone that would reject Jesus. Reject Jesus and defile Jesus and, and undermine Jesus and his work. You know what false teachers want you to believe? Everything but the truth. Everything but the truth. Make everything sound nice. In Matthew's Gospel... Jesus himself told the disciples that few people would believe the gospel and be saved. Right? That's the truth. Matthew 7, 13 through 15, Jesus said, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. And here's a little warning he added at the end. Look at verse 15. It says, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. Be careful. Be careful who you listen to. Be careful what you read. You need to know God's word. There's only one way to be saved, and that's by placing your faith in Jesus Christ. That's it. There is no other way. You can't earn it. You can't buy it. You can't be good enough. You can't do enough good deeds. It's only by faith. So for you and I this morning, knowing our eternity is secure because we have trusted Jesus should be a tremendous comfort to our troubled hearts. And so this morning as we close our time together, again, I swear, I'm with you. I know bad things happen. I know life is hard. Life is difficult. Things happen. We see crime. We see sickness. We see injustice everywhere. And yes, we even see death. We know that. We've all been touched by death. We have to be completely numb or heartless to not be negatively in impacted by what we see that's going on all, all around us. We, we just, it just, it hurts us. But Jesus knows. Jesus knows exactly what we're going through. Jesus knows our struggles. He wants to comfort us. He, he completely identifies us as a human. In Hebrews 4, 14 to 16, it says this, it says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, 
but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jesus is saying, I'm here for you. I'm here to take this away from you. I'm here to give you comfort in these tough times. So I ask you, is your heart troubled this morning? Right? Is your heart troubled this morning? If so, take it to the throne. Take it to the throne. Give it to Jesus. He's, he's saying, give it to me. Let me carry it for you. Let me comfort you. In this passage this morning that, that John has showed us as Christians, that we've seen three ways that our troubled hearts can be tr- comforted. We know that Jesus is God and in control of all things. That should give us some peace. That should give us comfort. We know that Jesus has prepared a dwelling place for us and we will spend our eternity in his presence. It's a great comfort. And we also know that Jesus is, has provided the only way to be forgiven of our sins through faith in Jesus, right? That's a great comfort to us. So this morning, brothers and sisters in Christ, draw comfort. Draw comfort in these truths when your heart's troubled. And this morning as we close our time together, if there's anything on your heart that, that, that you are struggling with, give it to Jesus. As, as, we, as we come, as our, as our, uh, as our men come to, to close us out, as, as Rod comes to, to give us a closing hymn, maybe you just need to not sing this morning. Maybe you need to just bow your head and, and, and give some things to the Lord and, and, and draw some comfort from him this morning. And there are others here this morning that, that maybe you need somebody to pray with you. Maybe there's some things that are just a little too heavy for you. You need to get some things off your chest. Grab a hand of a neighbor next to you. If you, need, if you want me to pray with you, I'd love to pray with you. Whatever the Lord would have you do this morning before you leave this place, gain comfort. Give it to the Lord. All right. Let's pray, and we'll have a, a few moments to respond. God, thank you for this passage. Thank you for uh, the comfort of your word. Thank you for uh, the Holy Spirit. The, the comfort that, that he brings, that he gives. Father, I, I pray this morning that as we close our time together, Lord, that, uh, that, that some in this room, Father, would, would lay down some, some, some burdens and some hurts that they've been carrying for a long time. And, Father, that, that you would bring that comfort to their hearts, Lord, that, we, that you know. You, you know the sting of death. You, you know what it's like to, to, to suffer and, and, to, and to hurt in a way that we can't even imagine. You fully identify with us, God. Lord, I, I thank you for uh, this example. I thank you for this passage. And Father, I thank you for your faithfulness to us, Lord, that, that you have made a way for us to be reconciled to God uh, through your own blood. So, Father, this morning I, I, I pray for, for those in our midst, Lord, that uh, first that, that don't know you, Father, that, that have no peace, have no comfort, have no hope of peace, have no hope of comfort. Father, I pray that you would prick their hearts this morning as well. Father, I pray that you would draw them to yourself. Father, that you would, you would show them that they, for you, their need to be saved. Father, that they will have no peace. They will have no comfort apart from you. Father, move on their hearts. God, thank you again for, for loving us the way that you do. Be glorified in this day. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.